Oh my goodness. All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon for our early learning is no small matter screening and panel discussion. Um, I am your host, Dr. Balan Joseph. I am the director of Thrive by Five. Um, we are a network of about 35 organizations working to collectively impact the percentage of children who enter into kindergarten ready, quote unquote ready, because there's a whole bunch that goes into ready. Um, as you can see on the screen, we have a more detailed description. This is our newly rolled out description. So I'm going to read it just to make sure I don't mess anything up. So Thrive by Five is a cross-sector network of collaborating organizations and families focused on the equitable development for lifelong success of the whole child age zero to five. We accomplish this by applying or amplifying services and supports available to families because every child is everyone's child. So on the next screen, you'll see some of our partners. This is not all of them. Um, and if your organization is not up there, uh, by the end of this event, I'm going to try to twist your arm a little bit to get your organization up there because it takes all of us working together to do this very important work. Next slide. Thank you. Oh, just skip one. Go back. Oh. The vision, do you see the vision? You can go back to the left. Oh. I know. <laughs> nope, this isn't the right PowerPoint. Yeah, can you close it and reopen? Okay, give me just a second. Okay. That's okay. Technical challenges. It always happens, never fails. That's normal, right? So while they're pulling that up, I'll give you a rundown of how today is gonna work. So we are not showing the entire documentary film, No Small Matter. We are showing two really important clips from the documentary and we're gonna center our discussions around it. So after the first clip, we'll have a panel discussion and then we'll do the second clip and it'll work the exact same way. We wanted to have some time to do a little bit of Q&A, um, but time just won't permit for that. Uh, but we will share the um, contact information of all of our speakers. So if you have additional questions, you can reach out to them at your convenience. Okay. All right. Look at that. It worked right out. Yes, yes, yes. So our vision, every child in Pinellas County enters kindergarten prepared to thrive in school and in life. Our mission is to mobilize all parts of our community to create equitable opportunities for young children to thrive. And our impact goal is for 90% of Pinellas County kindergartners to be ready or they will be ready by 2028. So we have been um, blessed to have our chancellor of early, learner, early learning, um, Matt Mears to uh, share a brief um, message for us. He couldn't join us today, but we're so grateful that he would take the time out of his busy schedule to record a message for us. So we're going to watch that message and then we'll jump into our first clip. Hello and welcome to the No Small Matter film screening. You are in for a treat, but it's it's not your ordinary kind of treat. It's it's a it's um definitely one of those thought provoking perspective adjusting experiences that are so valuable when a community comes together and has an honest conversation about a very important issue and i want to say how much i appreciate you being here and your involvement with the thrive by five organization and effort I don't know of anything more important in our communities than coming together and making sure that every child is not only able to survive, but to thrive by five because they have all the skills and the training needed to succeed in kindergarten because they're 100% kindergarten ready. So I love that work you're doing. I'm sorry I can't be with you to uh, attend this event in person. But I'm so thankful to have a moment to give you a greeting. And in the next couple of minutes, I want to share a story that has 
really moved me. It's about two courageous women. And when one was in crisis and the other came and did a small act of kindness that ended up feeding, uh, being the, the conduit to feed 3,000 workers in a migrant camp who were in desperate uh, straits. So uh, let me share my screen here and let you uh, take a look at Florence Owens Thompson and uh, this amazing uh, woman, a migrant worker. Uh, she's pictured here, she's 32 years old. She's the mother of seven children. And uh, let me tell you a little bit about what happened just before this picture was taken. They, uh, Ms. Thompson and her family were going to harvest cotton in Southern California, only there was an early snow and that crop was destroyed. So they got in a rickety old car, drove 400 miles to Napomo, California, where they were gonna pick the uh, garden peas uh, just like you would put with mashed potatoes and some gravy, those yummy peas. Unfortunately, there was a blight that destroyed the crop. So there they were, there was no work. Their car had broken down and they were camped uh, with other migrant workers who were there to pick peas. And so there they were at the pea pickers camp and they literally had sold the tires off their car. They were digging frozen, uh, digging vegetables out of the frozen ground. And again, with seven children, a lot of mouths to feed. And down that road near the pea pickers camp on her way to San Francisco was Dorothea Lange. She was a photographer. She had her equipment and actually she drove by and just kind of noticed out of the corner of her eye this pea pickers camp sign and initially wasn't going to stop. But she thought about it, turned around her car and went down and took several photos of Miss Thompson. She took those with her to San Francisco. Those ran in the paper and there was an outpouring of compassion and support and food arrived from the city to feed these migrant workers who were in such a desperate plight. And so the two quick takeaways I want to share with you is that big changes can come from small acts of kindness. Dorothea Lange turned her car around and she used the skills she had to capture the need. And the second lesson and this is particularly relevant for this film screen, is that people are moved by individual stories. And so let's work together, become great storytellers, and let's tell stories together about how we as a community can value early care education, can value making sure that every child is kindergarten ready. And, and as we do that, I'm so excited about the results we'll have together. So enjoy the, the film. I'm sure there'll be some great conversation. And my, my guess is that after you see it, like me, you will be moved to find out and discover what's that one additional thing that you can do to make a difference to help children succeed. Well, uh, with that, I'm going to uh, wrap it up here and uh, wish you all a very good evening. Thank you so much. Second, what he said, uh, this film, even without watching the whole thing, the, the clips that you will see are very thought provoking um, and they will leave you wanting to figure out, well, what can I do as an individual and as an organization to be a part of the solution in terms of setting all of our children up for success? Um, so our very first clip that we're going to look at is focusing on brain science. I'm not even going to try to go into all of the details of it. I'm just going to move out of the way and I'm going to let you see it. <laughs> and then afterwards, we're going to talk about it. Literally, our experiences shape our brains. Our brains grow faster during the first five years of life than they ever will again. And the older we get, the harder it is to change what's there. This is why this early period is so important. If you miss the right experiences or if you disrupt those circuits, then you have some weakened foundation that your brain is going to have to deal with for the rest of your life.
So what has the biggest impact on how well the brain gets wired? Us. Boo. It's not flashcards or fancy apps that build a healthy brain. It's everyday back and forth interactions with loving, supportive adults. School is basically anywhere with anyone. Come on, let's show Madley's favorite game. Okay, you got her legs? Yeah. Okay. Social interaction is brain food for the child's healthy development. Oh, oh. <laughs> Hi, baby. These everyday moments with the child are actually learning moments for the child. Mama! Mama! <laughs> the science has never been clearer. Babies' early experiences and the connections that they have with those important adults in their lives during this time of incredible brain development create the foundation for all that follows. You want to pet Koopa? Oh, is he giving you kisses? So this really raises the stakes on what we provide for children in the earliest years of life. If we don't get that right, then from then on, we're basically fixing something that's broken. We are inviting families to our parenting program. It's free okay. and it's for moms that have babies. They can attend the program with the babies. Como esta? Avance is a two-generation program that partners parent education about child development with early childhood education for little ones zero to three. Almost 30% of people in Waco live in poverty. There are zip codes and census tracts in Waco where one in four children go hungry. The one-year-old at that house, one years old, he doesn't know how to sit up. We were in shock with that kid. We were like, wow, he's one and he can't say anything. He doesn't sit up, he doesn't walk. You can work with children until you're blue in the face, but if the home environment is also not transformed, then that child's opportunities for success will be limited. We've been seeing the impacts of early childhood adversity on health, on behavior, on life outcomes for a very, very, very long time. But what we now know is the mechanism. We know how early adversity leads to all of these different negative outcomes. And that is what we now understand to be toxic stress. To understand toxic stress, we've got to understand the stress response system itself. The stress response system is this amazing evolutionary system that was designed to save our lives. The folks who did not evolve a stress response, they're gone. They got eaten. So let's imagine you're a one-year-old in prehistoric times. You've just woken up from your nap, you're hungry, and your loincloth really needs changing. So you step outside the cave, and nobody's there. Instinctively, you know something's wrong. Without adults there to care for you, you're totally helpless. And that's when your stress response system kicks into gear. Immediately what happens is that our brain sends a signal to release stress hormones. So we release adrenaline and cortisol, and these hormones activate a whole slew of changes to our brains and bodies. Our heart starts to pound, our pupils dilate, our airways open up. The brain tells you, you're in a dangerous situation, you need to do whatever it takes to protect yourself. So you do the one thing you can to tell the world you need help. <laughs> And then mom, dad, or grandma Grog comes along, your stress response system powers down, and you know everything's gonna be okay. Fast forward 40,000 years. Stress is still a part of everyday life for babies and young children, even if some of the causes are a little bit different.
the stress response evolved to switch on immediately in the face of a threat. Now it's a pot lid on Daddy's head. <laughs> but it's the comforting presence of caring adults that teaches the brain to switch it off when the threat is passed. We're just talking about being responsive. Just letting a child see that when she sends out a signal that she's distressed or scared, she can count on the fact that a caregiver is going to be there in some way to help address that situation. But what if the stress in a young child's life never stops? Violence in the home or in the neighborhood, parental drug addiction, incarceration, or mental health problems, severe neglect or abuse. And what if the adults around that child don't or can't help them cope with it? When children are experiencing situations of fear and adversity, and they do not have that buffering caregiver, they continue to pump out high levels of adrenaline and cortisol. And here's the problem. If that stress hormone stays elevated, it actually starts to disrupt the development of brain circuits. And then we start to see the health problems that are associated with toxic stress. Toxic stress takes direct aim at the prefrontal cortex, undermining a child's ability to concentrate, control their emotions, or get along with others. A biological problem that becomes a behavioral one when a child gets to school. The brain basically goes on fight or flight mode. So when they walk into a classroom, they continue to respond as if they're in a stressful, dangerous, unpredictable environment. But to a teacher, that child looks like they're just misbehaving. That's a problem child. When my kids show symptoms of toxic stress, they get suspended. I literally saw a patient in clinic two weeks ago who has been suspended 26 times from transitional kindergarten. The child is five years old. But the damage from toxic stress goes beyond the developing brain. There are also effects on metabolism, on the immune system, on the cardiovascular system, with profound consequences for physical health and mental health. When those markers are set in childhood, they impact the way our bodies work for the rest of our lives. Heart disease, cancer, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, experiencing high doses of early adversity, doubles your risk for seven out of 10 of the leading causes of death in the United States of America. That's nuts. Kids growing up in low-income families are especially vulnerable to toxic stress. Today, that's nearly half the children under six in America. So when I think about toxic stress, I think about how it cascades down. The electricity bill can't be paid. Your lights go out. You can't put things on the table. Everybody's unhappy. After a while, adults are relating in certain ways that aren't healthy. Children are relating in certain ways that aren't healthy. You're living in a community that's doing things that's not healthy. And all of it begins to have a cumulative impact on a five-year-old. So this actually argues for why we shouldn't be thinking just about the children. Because children live in families. We cannot transform the lives of children if we don't transform the lives of their parents as well. Part of helping families make that shift is helping them create a dream and a goal and then think about what are the steps that I need to do in order to make that dream a reality. I was working in the chicken plants for like seven, eight years, working on the two plants. My first husband used to like, be in jail a lot of times, and I'd be like taking care of my kids by myself. So that's why it's struggling me to go to both jobs. I was going to work at 12 midnight, get off at 6, and then at 6, go to house, pick up the babies, get them dressed for school, drop in at school, and then go to my second job at 8 in the morning, get off at 5, buy some fast food, take them to the bed like around 6, 37 almost, and they didn't like it. They don't, they want to be outside work, playing and having fun, and I was so exhausted, I couldn't do it. I worked in the restaurant for like five years, when I was 13 years old. So 
so I can understand. And then I was w one day on the street, and then these girls were passing flyers. They told me, no, there's a good program. Baban said they can help you out if you want to finish ED, and they can take care of the baby for free, and they teach you how to be with the kids. So I was like, yes, uh, this is my opportunity right there. We're going to talk about the brain. When you have your child in a stimulating environment, his brain is going to grow. How can we exercise the brain? Singing to our children, reading to our children, talking to our children. I'm a mom for four kids, and I thought I was the best mom. Like, I know how to take care of my kids. Nobody's going to tell me what to do or how to do it, right? But no, I learned a lot of stuff from them. Like, I couldn't believe it. Hola, ¿quién habla? And then my son, I see improvement on him because now he's turned around when he hears the sounds. <laughs> I learned the eating, I learned on the uh, education, I learned that you have to at least hug them because they can know that you love them and you, you're there. We find some colors. So the teachers are like helping me a lot. <laughs> What I love about Avance is the early childhood education is forward thinking. It's, we want our child to succeed in the future, but the ESL, GED classes and workforce development training is the here and now. So I'm going to gain the skills that I need to lift my family out of poverty. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We are going to continue working on some math, and then we also want to continue working on some, some of your writing with your constructed responses. Always in my dream, I want to be a CNA, a certificate nurse assistant. I mean, you don't get paid a lot, but at least try to start somewhere. This program changed my life. I learned in English here. I have a better job. I can talk with my son's teacher in the school. I learned to be a better mom. I learned to understand my children and to be respectful to my kids. They helped me to be as successful and dream again. I learned if you believe it, you can have. All this I say, thank you, teacher. But I don't have nothing to pay. All they do for me. Just I wish one day all the Mars like me have this opportunity. We're gonna do it. We're all gonna finish. Right? We're gonna be a better, better, better moms. Bye, Miss Beth. Bye, Gracie. Bye, Bye guys. Bye. I'm gonna do it because I want them to see that I did it so they can do it. Thank you. Bye, nos vemos mañana. See you tomorrow. So without further ado, we're going to get the conversation started about this very first clip. Um, so I'm going to introduce our moderator, Pastor Carlos Sr. And I'll read your bio. You can come on up here while I'm reading it so they can see your face. So Carlos Sr. is a passionate intergenerational communicator and has a blend of experience as a writer, team leader in not-for-profit enterprises, public speaking, human services, and partnership building. He is a lead pastor at New Hope St. Pete and fatherhood engagement specialist with USF Family Study Center. He has been married to Chantel, his best friend, for 24 years, and they are the proud parents of six-year-old Lizzie Grace. I'm going to pass it over to you. Thank you, Mom. Well, good afternoon. Uh, we are super excited uh, to have some wonderful dialogue. Um, around um, No Small Matters, and we have a great uh, couple of uh, group of panelists uh, to invite up uh, who are all extremely accomplished in this area, and uh, we're excited to hear from them. Uh, uh, first up on uh, our panel is Dr. Rick Davis. Uh, Dr. Davis is an experienced uh, executive and entrepreneur. He has an extensive background and expertise in education uh, program management. 
Uh, he currently serves as the president of Concerned Organization uh, for Quality Education of Black and Brown Students, COQUEBS. And he is the vice president of Unified Personnel Board and the chair of the Citizens uh, Advisory Committee, South St. Petersburg, uh, 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 CRA. Uh, if you would help me uh, welcome <laughs> Rick Davis. Uh, next, we have uh, Felicia Harris. Uh, she is the executive director and owner of Hope Academy International. Uh, her, her career began in early childhood in the early childhood industry in 2007 uh, as an assistant preschool uh, teacher. Um, and then she has uh, gone on to lead in the industry in a number of ways. And so we're excited to have uh, Felicia Harris with us on the panel. And then finally, uh, we have Dr. James McHale. Uh, he's a professor of psychology at USF and directs the USF Family Study Center. Uh, he has been, uh, he has spent his entire career uh, focused on infant and early childhood development in diverse family systems. Uh, just last year, he was recognized by Stanford, uh, Stanford University as one of the top 2% of scholars worldwide in his field of family science. Uh, we are certainly happy to have uh, Dr. James McHale with us to join the panel. We're gonna allow Dr. Uh, McHale to get clipped in. First question is for him. All right. <laughs> We're going to jump right in. Uh, and so uh, one of the things that we saw in the clip, uh, there was a question that was posed uh, that really resonated. What has the biggest impact on how the brain gets wired? And then the answer was us. Uh, now, uh, just given uh, your experience in the field, how can parents and caregivers encourage healthy brain development in children zero to five. How long I got? <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, I mean, I think that they, they showed us, um, but they didn't tell us that they were showing us. And what was important in that was not going down to Walmart and buying a bunch of electronic toys and, 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 and it, you know, stuffing their heads full of stuff. It was, it was the being with, it was the laughing with, it was the touching and caressing and following their lead. Um, I, you know, I think we've, we've gotten to a point now where we like try to push down education earlier and earlier and earlier. And that's, um, that's not the way babies are equipped when they come. They want to figure stuff out for themselves. They want to explore. They want to tip, pick up a rock and see what's underneath it. And when we take that away from them in the way that we modern parent, um, you're not allowing the kids to be the masters of their own destiny, so to speak. So just to be with kids, follow the kid's lead. But that how do you do that when you're the mom on there who is going from one job to another and picking up fast food and running from one thing to another? And you can make parents feel incredibly guilty that you're not following your child's lead. Not, and, and so, you know, I think that the right answer is for every parent. Um, and we, going back to our very first uh, baby talk, Rick, you know, the, that we talked about floor time, 20 minutes a day with your child, just on the floor, you know, no TV, no cell phone, anything, just being together play and if you can't do 20 minutes 10 if you can't do 10 five but every day so the child has that quality time and you know it's not just for babies my kids are 19 and 20 it's for them too how much how often do you spend 20 minutes with your child just talking about what's happening with them it's a lifetime thing but for the babies it's essential and so there are ways that you can support parents who are doing god's work already and doing everything they can to love and take care of their kids and provide some of this information that gives them a little bit of a toehold but it's not about expensive stuff. It's not about education. It's not about early curricula. It's just about being with the babies and honoring and following their experiences. I think that when you read the babies, it's not about them knowing what the words are. It's about them seeing the book, touching the book, eating the book, touching you face while they're reading. It's about the, the, the fun of being with the book, right? That's what it's about when you're reading to a newborn or a one month old. So by the time they get to circle time in preschool, 
the book reading is the most enjoyable, fun thing in the world. It's not like, oh, I don't want to sit here. Let me go see what's going on over here. The, the book time is the regulating wonderful time, right? So I think that there's lots of simple things that, that we can share with parents without guilting them, without sort of making it feel like you're not doing a good job, because none of us feel like we're doing a good job parenting. Right. So to really be able to kind of meet parents where they are and just help to celebrate the great work they're doing and give them a little a little bit extra. Um, you know, I, I could talk for hours, but I think that's the core. I think that that's really the essence. Yeah. And that uh, transitions us into our second question. And, uh, and I'm going to pose this to you, Dr. Davis. Uh, there was a, a quote uh, from the clip. Uh, you can work with children until you're blue in the face. But if the home environment is not also transformed, then the child's opportunity for success will be limited. And, uh, and Dr. McHale, you know, brought, brought us some things. How, how do we uh, uh, come alongside families uh, to support them without, uh, you know, making them feel um, um, inferior or, um, as, as, as Dr. McHale, uh, shamed or guilty? How do parents, caregivers, community stakeholders, how do we all come together to support healthy brain development? We have to, um, it's not just the child as was mentioned, it's also the family and the environment that the child is coming from. So support, uh, in my view, means not only trying to provide young children with the kind of positive experience that allows them to grow and develop, but also to try to support, one way of supporting that child is also supporting the family and the structure around that child. Uh, some years ago, when we, I was more directly involved in um, a lot of these um, early childhood centers, we made it an actual practice to not only assess the child needs, but also assess the family's need. Because we recognize that sometimes that's the most direct way of helping that child. Uh, families are struggling. Many of them are, especially families coming from historically uh, underserved communities. And we have to understand that lack of resources sometimes create a negative environment. All parents, I have never met a parent did not want the best for their child. That's where every parent starts. The real question is, some of us have more resources than others. And the challenge now is trying to make sure that we equip uh, those families and those uh, communities that may not have those resources with enough support so that they can provide that uh, strong environment. I want to give you, I don't want to get too long-winded, but I want to give you one long-winded, one example of an experience that I had with uh, Dr. McHale, who I consider to be somewhat of a resident expert on this subject. And I was just sharing it with him many years ago. This was a long time ago when I first heard him talk about cognitive development at an early stage, I found myself going home to my grandchildren who were toddlers at the time and getting down on the floor with them and deciding, I don't know where you guys are going, but I'm going with you. I'll just keep you out of danger, but let's explore together. But that, it was my way of trying to figure out how do I internalize all of this information about cognitive development and creating a positive experience with children and what I've tried to do, at least throughout my career, is to take that message on and to advocate strongly on behalf of children and parents who need the support so that they can help their children to thrive and to be successful. Thank you. Um, now, now, Ms. Harris, uh, and again, this is a, a, a great segue into, uh, into our third and, and final question. Um, you know, a prominent subject in the clip uh, centered around negative stressors. Mm -hmm. What are some ways, and, and there's probably been no greater uh, negative stressor in our lifetime than COVID, right? right? What are some ways that uh, you've seen families coping with COVID uh, and, um, and, and some of the impacts just in terms of uh, impacts on their social, emotional, uh, cognitive development? And what are some things that you all are doing at your, your center to, to help families? Um. Goodness gracious. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I'm going to pick up my phone because um, I will get long winded. Um, I love everything that we're doing right now, this entire setup, um, because as a child care provider, 
director, owner, like I tell anyone, I've been a preschool teacher longer than I've ever been anything. That's my heart. That's, that's what, you know, early childhood is the foundation, is the blueprint. And I'm so grateful that we're all here together having this conversation. Um, so I wrote some notes because um, just the intro alone, I'll go there. <laughs> um, for me and my team, um, I like to say my teachers, but me and my team members, what I did. It was just a little thing. Okay. We're good. All right. Uh, um, okay, let me set on it then. Okay. So um, we're seeing a lot of social emotional insecurity in preschoolers um, in the wake of, of COVID-19, the aftermath, post-COVID. Um, we're seeing that in the form of stress through anxiety, fear, worry, um, which is it's affecting eating habits, sleeping habit, habits, activity levels within the classroom. Um, what we're doing here at Hope Academy International is we want children to know that first and foremost, you know, that they're, they're, they're safe, flat out. And we're teaching children how to de-stress and unwind. Um, ways that we're doing that, environment, physical environment, social environment, to plural, physical environment, um, not just pretty furniture and, and nice things, but the structure of that environment, making sure it's age appropriate, um, social um, environment, the interactions between peers, parents, and caregivers is so important right now more than ever. Uh, I'm grateful that right now, not just in our organization, Hope Academy International, but a lot of childcare facilities um, and you know schools around the nation, we're starting to see more interaction between teachers and families. Um, we have children eight to ten hours a day, Friday, so we we're, we're seeing what's going on. Yes, but we take up the bulk of the you know of that time with our babies. So um, basically, making sure that social environment is key with the families, the parents, the mothers. Um, and then of course, you know, um, temporal, routines, schedules. Um, I don't have to tell anyone in this room that when COVID-19 impacted each and every one of us, what routine? So now it's just going back to the basics with our most precious, our youngest. And, um, that's, that's, that's really the gist of it. Just going back to the basics and just understanding. And, and there was a clip, you know, that, that just really stood out to me because it, it's just like, we really, we really just don't know what the home life is. And um, it's not, the child is bad. You know, that this, this child is five years old, was suspended 20 times. Like we, that toxic stress, it's real. And COVID nineteen, we're seeing a lot of that, but it can be. It can. We can do something about this. Sitting in rooms like this together, working together as a team, we can do something about this. This early childhood is the is the foundation. So you know, I'm happy we're here. Cheese. Before we close out, <laughs> give, uh, give each of you thirty seconds to give us just a final thought uh, around uh, clip or, or just anything that's come up. And speak up a little bit. I think it's a little hard for the folks in the back to hear. You. Okay. Thank you. All right. Well, I'll explain to you what this is. <laughs> I first used this about 16, 17 years ago, talking to our legislative delegation and uh, invited them to reflect on whether they had been driving in downtown Tampa at that time. Now it's over here on Brian Derry, whatever it is, right? They're trying to make significant changes in the roadway structure. It's taken forever, Herculean amount of effort just to make small changes because of the original infrastructure that got laid down by the city and regional planners. They're constrained. Baby's brain's the same way. Mm. The, what we create early on, you and I are sitting here with the stress response systems that got created when we were one, two, three years old, and we carry it for the rest of our lives. Can we make changes? Yeah. Small changes over a long period of time with Herculean effort. So that's why you got to get it done right. There's this, uh, Bob Dylan's my boy. And Bob said, may you have a strong foundation when the winds of changes shift. 
my 19, 20 year old are going through lots of changes right now. And I'm blessed for the quality care that they got in the first three years of their life here in Pinellas County, over here at the Children's Village, YWCA from Ms. Vivian and Ms. Bev and the people who took good care of them uh, because they're, they're going through changes and we're gonna go through changes in our life, but yeah. it gotta happen early on. Yeah. So that, that's my two cents. Yeah, I think I, I, the one point that I would like to leave most of us with is this challenge is not a new challenge. It's been going on for way longer than I would like to admit, to be honest with you. And as an advocate in this space, uh, I am sometimes more concerned with whether or not we can do things that are going to have some significant impact. In other words, um, if our children are not getting to kindergarten ready, how do we change that in a way that is measurable? And I'm not talking about good intentions. Uh, yeah. We have seen a lot of efforts, not just in this county, but across the country over the years to address this issue. And today it's still with us. The pandemic has made it worse, made it even more challenging, but I am, much more interested in trying to figure out what can we do systemically that will, to be honest with you, it comes down to dollars and cents. Mm. It comes down to how many dollars are we prepared as taxpayers to put into the early learning and development space. And until we get behind our legislatures to put the funding where it needs to be, we will continue to struggle with this issue, in my opinion, because it's woefully underfunded, I think. And I'm, 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 I'm including all of the traditional funders. I know Early Learning Coalition puts a lot of money in there. I know JWB puts a lot of money in there. United Way, collectively, it is still not enough. It doesn't quite rise to the magnitude of the challenge. And we have to do something intentional and deliberately that will change that in a way that changes the course or direction that we're going in right now. I could kind of uh, talk about that for about an hour, but I will. <laughs> and I would just like to add on, um, in addition to funding, um, for me, I would definitely like to see um, more input from providers and teachers, preschool teachers in the classroom. Um, I appreciate everyone and what everyone is doing on um, our legislative you know, level and things of that nature. But we don't know if we don't know what's going on in the classroom from the people that are working with these children day in and day out. That's that's just heavy on my heart right now. It, it really is. So, you know, money and input, please. <laughs> we want to thank you uh, not only for uh, joining us on the panel today, but for all the work uh, that you've been doing in the field. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank we you. Get up for our panel. That was so good. We can just like drop the mic and everybody go to their cars now. <laughs> thank y'all so much. That really blessed me. And I know this stuff. So to, <laughs> to hear from you, is it just hits differently. So thank you. Um, everybody thank my husband. My husband been up here clipping people and all this. I appreciate you. Thank you. So we're going to jump into our second clip. Um, and it ties so well into what was just talk, talked about. We're going to see um, the child care crisis that exists nationally. Um, but that's also right here in our own backyard. Uh, and then we'll, we'll talk about it again. Um, so I'm going to again move out of the way. And can you pause it? I somebody said the sound was kind of low. Let's see if I can. Jesse, was it all over? There we go. That should be a little bit better. I turned it all the way. Oh, I don't want to pause it because it's really low in there. Okay. <laughs> Hi, big girl. Hi. 
Hi. Hey. 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 I'm cooking. I don't want to go back to work tomorrow. Let's just spend like ten dollars a day playing the lottery till we strike a big. I'll start off with a million. What do you say? <laughs> Sending her to a daycare center was not something we wanted to do for at least a year. But we're at a home where both of us have to work in order to survive. We have to work. You see your daddy? It's not like there's a smorgasbord of childcare out there. We were lucky to find what we found. It was a scramble, like we were going to childcare facilities every day. The availability is slim to none. We really only have a few options, despite teacher ratio, despite class size, they all cost the same. Of course, it's gonna require us to basically scale back some of our spending and appropriate some of our savings. You wanna hold this for me? <laughs> I don't know how people do it. I really don't. Let's go change you. Come on. You wanna change clothes? Sorry. So tomorrow, you have to go to school, okay? And I know it'll be okay. You're a big, strong girl. No one's gonna love your child the way you do. Nobody's gonna care for your child the way you will. But I'm looking for the closest thing to it. I'm so sorry that I have to do this to you. It's so rough. You're just so not ready for this. I know you're not. All right, let's go. If I could stay at home, I'd stay home in a heartbeat. When I had my second son, I quickly began to realize that childcare was going to cost us $2,000 a month. That was the mortgage. I have what I can imagine is a very good starting out first job, you know, after college, and I still cannot afford childcare. I would either have to work to sustain childcare, but I wouldn't be able to pay my other bills. Um, or I would just have to, you know, stay at home and not pay child care to take care of my child, but then I'm not making any income. But if you go for a subsidy or you go to ask for money to help, they look at you funny because they're like, you make too much. You don't make enough to do that. So I'm stuck in that kind of middle class bracket. I didn't have anywhere to go. I did not have any structural support. And I ended up having to move into a homeless shelter. My son cried so much at that daycare within this woman's home that eventually I had to quit my job because while I couldn't prove it, I knew something was wrong. And he was too young to articulate anything. As he got a little older, he was able to tell me, Mommy, she just yelled. She yelled and screamed a lot. Kaylee was not our first pregnancy. We have actually we actually miscarried with twins and then miscarried again after that. So being able to have a viable live birth and child was even more, we wanted to take care of her even more so. Um, I'm getting teary. Um, because of the fact that, you know, it took us that much to get her here that, I'm sorry, I didn't know this was gonna happen. Um, that putting her life in someone else's hands means so much. So from the beginning, Knowing what I saw in child care, I didn't want to put her there. So we just, you know, bounced her around family member to family member until we made the decision for um, her dad to stay home. 
this is not the way it's supposed to be. Here, come with me, guys. I found a really great spot where I think we're gonna be able to find a lot of really cool bugs. We're gonna try to find bugs. We're gonna find out what kind of bugs- Bug! They... No, it's flying around. Well, hold on. Night. Our job is to find out what kind of bug it is so we can bring it into the yellow room and then guess what we'll do? Show it. We're gonna show it. You're totally right, Emily. We're gonna act as bug experts. So what does teaching and instruction and learning look like in a high quality program? What's this? It looks like poop. Well, I don't think it's poop because it doesn't feel like poop. <gasps> Grab a book. Grab one of the books, Blake. Why? Because we can look it up. It might be an egg of some kind. Okay. In a high quality program, you don't see little kids sitting at desks. You don't see a teacher in front of a room talking and talking and talking to a bunch of kids in the back of the room. It's that! Oh my! It's an egg! What kind of egg? It's, it's a cricket egg! It's a, a, it's a cricket egg! No, it's a, it's a, it's a, like a mantis egg. It's a praying mantis egg! Oh my gosh! Oh my god, we found a baby egg! This is amazing! Okay. If you want to have a child who's in an environment where there's a lot of play and there's a lot of ability to explore. But you also need to have an adult there who's doing the scaffolding. You know what? We can keep this in our class until it hatches. <gasps> yeah! You see the teacher encouraging the children to explore and understand and learn from whatever it is they're doing. I love that you noticed that it had lines around the egg. Really nice observation. It's not just free play, but it looks a lot like play, because everyone's having fun. How to take care of a, an egg. All right, let's see what it says. What do you think it's going to say? You have chickens. You know how to take care of eggs. But not tarantula egg. You keep saying the word tarantula. I thought we found that it was a different kind of egg. I thought it was a praying mantis egg. Oh, yeah. Well, let's look at a picture. Maybe let's look at it. We'll look at a tarantula egg. We'll look at a pre mantis egg. And we'll see which one it is. We can measure things like teacher ratios, whether or not a teacher had a BA and the number of BAs in a classroom. Those are all very important. What really makes a huge difference in a child's life is how the child and teacher, child and adult interact. Thank you very much. Okay, we can make this. And we just take care of it. I want to be their Miss Honey. I want to be the one that's like, let's, you can do anything. Like, this is possible. Like, when they reflect on their preschool experience, I want them to have this weird memory of this person that may or may not have existed. That let them do things that they don't quite remember, but they remember it being really cool. And uh, it's weird to think that I'm not going to have that impact anymore. Hey, Sweet Jones, Rachel, how can I help you? It's all of us. All of us had second jobs last year. All of us. Early childhood, teachers make like under 30 grand a year. Oh yeah, early childhood. Yes, yeah, early. and as a preschool teacher, I basically make nothing, so I have a second job. This is what life is. Like, you work two jobs. Yeah, early childhood, yeah, you don't get paid early anything. Yeah, but you should, because it's the most important time. We had to supplement our incomes because we choose to teach here. Like, I'm not gonna lie, I've been here two extra years because I make excuses. I like it here. Today we have higher expectations than we've ever had of what child care teachers can and should accomplish. But we are placing those expectations on the back of a workforce that is earning poverty level wages. In this country, the typical child care teacher's wages fall below those of the people who take care of our dogs, who park our cars, who make our drinks. Child care teachers earn in the bottom three to five percent of the national wage scale. They've been at the bottom for the past 25 years and they haven't budged. It's not only unfair, from an economic point of view, it's downright stupid. This is where it starts. This is where their futures start. Their personalities, a lot of who they are, their character is developed within the first five years. And 
the appreciation or like like how they view preschool teachers is like it's like you don't matter. What line are we learning this week? Do you remember? Uh, F. Can you show me F? <coughs> Eight the F's out. Today we're gonna make a train, and we're, I'm gonna go chugga chugga choo choo all around this rug. And if you can tell me a word that starts with F, you can join the train. Oh. Are you ready, Charlotte? Foot. Foot. Join my train, girl. I can't move out of my parents' house. I can't have my own financial stability because I don't I just don't get paid enough. It just kind of devalues I think preschool teachers a lot and then it devalues the profession. It devalues the time that these kids have here. I don't know, it's it's um it's been difficult and it makes me angry. Not even gonna hold anything up because I would love to hear from our experts um, in regards to this clip. Um, so I'm going to call back up our moderator, Pastor Carlos, and he will introduce our second panel and they'll come up. Um, so here you go. Thank you. I apologize. This, uh, when I saw this stool, I was trying to figure out how I was gonna navigate it. Uh, <laughs> So, you know, it's hard for people to take you seriously if your legs dangle from your seat <laughs> like a five-year-old. Uh, <laughs> it's working out. Uh, listen, we're, again, ex uh, just as excited about this panel as we were at the first. Um, just a great group of uh, dedicated and uh, very accomplished people uh, in this area. Uh, our first uh, panelist is uh, Lindsay Carson. Uh, Lindsay has over 20 years of leadership in the early learning space. Uh, she currently is the CEO of the Early Learning Coalition of Pinellas County. Uh, she is a relentless advocate for young children, families, and early educators. Uh, she is the past chair of the statewide association uh, of early learning coalitions and, uh, and certainly remains a leader in the field. We want to welcome to the panel, Lindsay Carson. Next, we have Dr. Keisha Benson, who was born and raised in St. Petersburg, Florida, educated at Pinellas County Schools K, for, uh, for K through 12. Uh, she is a champion of public education. Uh, she received her doctorate in social work with a focus on uh, in community intervention and a uh, master's of social work uh, degree from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, she's an experienced educator, a dedicated community advocate, proven leader, Loving parent of three school age children, please welcome to the panel, Dr. Keisha Benson. <laughs> We're delighted to have uh, Diane Jacob with us today, uh, Senior Vice President and Director of Client and Community Relations with PNC Bank. Um, uh, Diane has served on more than 40 nonprofit boards now focused on early childhood education. Uh, through PNC Foundation, uh, PNC Foundations, uh, Grow Up, uh, great initiative, and serves on the board of the Early Learning Coalition of, of Hillsborough County, uh, Champions for Children, for which she is the chair, uh, and the Children's Movement. So we're uh, delighted to have Diane Jacob with us here on the panel. So again, we're gonna jump right in. And as you can see, this segment uh, dealt, uh, focused a lot on childcare and, uh, and the workforce. And our first question is going to uh, come to you, Lindsay. And, um, and, and you saw that, uh, you know, th the clip focused a lot on really several acute concerns, right? Accessible, affordable, and quality childcare, and also an extremely stressed early child care workforce. And so our question for you, Lindsay, is, is what you saw, uh, what we saw in the clip reflective of what we're seeing in Pinellas County? And, um, and what should, and why, why should what's going on 
uh, matter to community stakeholders, employers, funders, et cetera. Thank you so much. Uh, what you saw in the clip is very representative of what we see here in Pinellas County. Um, certainly COVID has exacerbated the challenges that we face, and I'm sure you've heard that a lot about a lot of different things. But the fact is, as Dr. Davis alluded to earlier, this has been a problem for quite some time, well before COVID. Right now, we have about a 12% vacancy rate in our preschools. Um, as of last week, 12% vacancy rate. We have about half of our preschools with waiting lists just to get kids into the programs, many of whom have waiting lists because they don't have enough staff. That equates to over three or 4,000 children who can't have access to care right now. And the fact is, while it is expensive, we all, we do have funding. The Early Learning Coalition just got $6 million to provide additional scholarships, but we don't necessarily have a place to put them. And so we have those opportunities and it is a big concern. Looking at our, our low to moderate income families, 37% of the children we serve, their parents are working in healthcare and social services. That is a huge chunk if you think about our population. 10% are in retail, 11% are in accommodations and food service. Y'all had to wait a little longer at a restaurant because there's not enough staff. This is an issue that impacts everyone. And of course, at our heart and in our mission, we're here for children. But the fact is it has an impact on the community at large. And it is also impacting our preschool teachers. 5% of the population we serve are actually preschool teachers who qualify for public assistance because their wages are so low. So we've seen a high turnover rate, which impacts the quality of education our children are having, that continuity of care that's so important to their emotional development that, that Dr. McHale was talking about earlier. And it's in the long run having impacts as, as our students enter into the K-12 system and we're seeing those behaviors and other things manifest. So we've got a lot of things going for us in Pinellas County, but we still have a lot of work to do. Now, uh, now Ms. Jacob, I, I wanna pivot to you and just, just given everything that, that Lindsay had to say, um, uh, clearly, PNC uh, Bank has made an, a significant investment in this area uh, mm -hmm. in terms of early childhood development. Can you talk to us a little bit about why it is such a big deal for you all? And would you uh, mind elaborating on some of the things that you're doing in the space? Sure. I'm happy to do so. Uh, really have to go back to the inception of the PNC Foundation, which was formed about 20 years ago, uh, and it was a reaction because our CEO was looking at the amount of money we were putting into the communities that we work in. And uh, it's part of our Main Street Bank approach that uh, we want to lift communities. So it's a, a corporate social responsibility issue for us, as well as um, caring for our own employees. So um, 20 years ago, the money was not uh, focused in any way. It was at the whim of the regional president or the client and community relations director, which is the job I have. Um, so he set out with a, a group of people to find the lowest common denominator, the foundational work that would lift communities and taking the very long view of making sure that uh, children and families have the best opportunity to succeed in school and in life. Uh, so in, in doing so, 20 years ago was when brain development science started to occur. Uh, and as a result of, of that knowledge, um, he in particular landed on the, the concept that early childhood education created that best foundation for the opportunity to move out of poverty, better health outcomes, all of those things that families need uh, in order to be successful. So uh, we created the foundation at that point and we have our own initiative called Grow Up Great, which is uh, a program that is bilingual. Uh, it er early on addressed uh, the issue of literacy um, since it's gone into math and science. And in fact, I funded a kindergarten class last year that was teaching their kids coding, which I thought was just so cool. Uh, I wish I knew how to do it, but, um, but nonetheless, having those kinds of focus for families through this foundation, uh, we now have committed $500 million 
into the foundation for that specific purpose. Uh, we've also created a new program in the last two years, um, enforcing racial and social equity, uh, and put $88 billion into those programs. Uh, and everything from removing the financial barriers uh, to help families grow their wealth, um, as well as those things that uh, give them opportunities moving forward as families. So that, that was the foundation uh, and uh, the foundation of our work as well. The Grow Up Great materials were developed with the Sesame Workshop and the Fred Rogers Company. And most of us know the, the quality of uh, the work that they do. And frankly, it was all about quality for us from the very beginning. So uh, I joined the company uh, 11 years ago and have spent my time, um, a majority of it relative to early learning. Uh, it's, it's, it is part of my job to, to resource those funds into the community, but I have to tell you, it was, uh, I like a good challenge and I found one um, and all of us would attest to that. But uh, it was also the most frustrating thing that I've ever uh, dealt with. Uh, the last three to five years, there's been better uh, traction in the field in terms of the awareness, um, the, the fact that companies are now starting to talk about not only uh, how to help their own employees through these issues from an employment and talent development standpoint, but also relative to the responsibilities to communities and our clients. So what we do now in family-friendly practices, when we learn those things that are important for early learning, we couldn't just turn a blind eye and not offer that to our own employees. So we have a, a plethora of family-friendly practices. Um, without question, family leave is, is part of that. Uh, and then uh, I'll, I'll tell you an example. We talked about telling stories, and I'm sorry I'm going on so long, but, uh, but about telling stories about uh, those people that are affected by policy. And we had a, a young woman that was hired in at a, a very moderate level, um, not yet in the management realm, but of childbearing age. And she was about to have her first child and uh, scared to death about what was coming. Um, and her husband traveled for his work. So um, th they were both working to make ends meet. So uh, we have a guidance resource policy that allows for um, women and families like her to get the kind of help that they need. And this is an internal um, guidance resource group that we have. Uh, so she called them and said, I'm not sure what to expect in terms of this pregnancy. I'm not sure what to do in terms of childcare and early learning following that. Uh, I don't know about my own health, let alone the baby's health. How do I navigate all these things? So the counselor started putting her through a program of the resources that are available through our company as well as outsourcing some things. Uh, so she was able through our search engine be able to find childcare for that child um, and well in advance so that she had a place to go once uh, the child was born. Uh, and then beyond that, uh, maternity health and child health and all of those resources that we have partnerships with uh, so that we could make sure that she had a a, a good transition into being a mother. And selfishly, that makes her a good employee for the company. So, um, and it makes her a candidate to move up. And as everyone in corporate America knows right now, it's difficult to find talent and to keep talent. So we want to use all the resources and the information that we have to make sure that happens. There's a whole lot more, but I'll ab abdicate at this point. Well, that's awesome. I think <laughs> I um, speak for many in the room. Uh, do you have any job openings? <laughs> <laughs> yes, in fact, we do. We always do. <laughs> now, Dr. Vincent, I, I want to sort of tag on uh, to the back end of that question. And uh, you have such a, uh, a diverse experience as, as both an educator and then also, of course, a mom of uh, three young children. Uh, both as an educator, as a mom, what are some things that maybe you would like to see employers do in this space uh, to support families, you know, maybe in addition to some of the things that 
that you heard Diane mention? No, absolutely. So I've had the pleasure of serving as um, a leader and an executive in higher education, nonprofits, and philanthropy for the past 25 years, working with children and families. And I have three children of my own. They're six, eight, and nine. So there was that video resonated with me because there was a season in my life where I remember being a full-time professor paying fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year for three kids in childcare. And thinking to myself, between childcare and student loans, I don't take anything else home. And what is the benefit to me to be in the workforce? And I think for me, I wanted to be there, but also being mindful of in that time I was teaching and teaching master's courses. And I remember they kept scheduling me for, for nights and weekends. And I said, my kids are in childcare all day. I want to see them in the evening. I want to. And they could not understand that. And there came a time when my, my husband and I decided it wasn't worth it anymore. And we left that position and we moved on. But when you think about retaining workforce and what that looks like, there's so many things. Your organization is doing some phenomenal work. But having those policies, whether they're family friendly policies or just flexible policies for all employees. So we think about something called universal design, where example of that would be if you see a curb and you see a cutout, that cutout can be used for anyone. It can be used for a stroller. It can be used for a wheelchair but it benefits everybody. So what workplace policies do you have in place that can do that? So of course we wanna think about some of the services around mental health for parents and others where they can access those services. We also wanna consider, do you give childcare subsidies? You know, there's some employees, I had a friend that worked for someone, if you were ill, they would send a nanny to your home. <laughs> you know, there are a lot of really creative ways that you can think about it. You can think about flexible work environments. Are you able to work from home? And then also examine your own policies. So if you have parental leave policies that I go both for men and women, I, my dissertation was on father involvement, so I'm really big on dads. Um, do you expect parents to answer the phone or employees all hours of the night and on weekends? Are you mindful of what else they have going on in their lives? So just being mindful of what you're putting out there. And then I think also having great mentorship. I had the pleasure of working for Lindsay as the former director of Thrive by Five. And I love the fact that as one of her leaders, she was able to share, she, she showed me what it meant to be a mother in the workforce and how she balanced that and what that looks like. And to be able to have that and see that. And I know in my last chief role, we even talked to all the different employees and say, what do you need and what does that look like? And even us just listening to them as working parents and what that, that meant so much to them. So investing back. I think also investing in the community as well. And Thrive by Five previously, we talked about even adopting a childcare center. You know, not only do the childcare personnel, some of them are impoverished right now, but some of the centers themselves are. So what are the needs there? As business leaders, how can we pour into them to make sure they have what they need? Um, can we also think about the fact that there's a long wait list right now for a lot of childcare centers? You know, some people are thinking about the fact that, hey, I'm pregnant now. I need to get on a wait list now for nine months from now. Do parents have access to that information? And can employers help you know, let them know what those opportunities are as well. So I think there's a lot of ways to engage and just, if you really care about a child in early learning and looking at that cognitive, social, emotional, physical, mental health of the child, what does that look like for their parent and family system and how can you support them and support the community in that process? I think we have time for, for maybe one more question. Okay, um, that, that this, is, this is sort of complex and, uh, you know, but you, you can't watch that clip in your heart not go out to, uh, you know, the men and mostly women that work in early child care education. Uh, do, do you have any thoughts about how we as a community might uh, come together to make sure that, that these child care centers are funded properly so that uh, the people that are taking care of, you know, our children zero to five, you know, are not living at or below the poverty line? Any thoughts? I'm never without words, but I don't want to. <laughs> I'll go for it. Okay, yes, I think there are things that we can do. First, um, as, as she mentioned in the video, one of the girls talked about just the respect. Um, and there's oftentimes, you know, conversations about who's a teacher, who's an instructor, who's a worker. I don't like the name worker. Um, we have early education professionals who are working in our preschools and our family child care homes each day. And so as a community, recognizing and respecting that as a profession doesn't pay the mortgage, but it is a start. Um, and recognizing that so that we can recruit them, um, recruit new folks into the field. From a wage standpoint, they are very low wage. And the fact is there's market failure. We just talked about how expensive childcare is for families. And yet those instructors or early educators are making less than the person who made your latte this morning in many cases. And so what we have found is what parents can afford and what the actual cost of high quality care is, is mismatched. Um, and that is, I mean, by definition, 
market failure. It requires an infusion of public resources in order to bridge that. Otherwise, we will continue to have difficulty bringing folks back into the workforce. Access to childcare is the main is the is the top reason that parents are not returning to the workforce in the wake of this great resignation. And we've got to be able to to bridge that. It's a public good. We subsidize corn. We subsidize public education as a whole. This is a public good because if we don't have, if families don't have access to care, we don't have employees to operate the rest of our community, not to mention, of course, the long-term benefits of early education because they are the workforce of tomorrow as well. And you hit on something right there. When you said the workforce of tomorrow, uh, the, the way to start moving this conversation forward and improving the lot of, of although all of you who work as um, providers is for corporations to understand what's happening. And as long as they understand that their pipeline for uh, qualified workers 20 years from now is not gonna be what it is today because you, you can't find skilled in and qualified workforce, then all of a sudden it starts to hit home. And one of the things that when, um, when I do funding in uh, West and Central Florida, that I always encourage is that uh, if we're funding an organization that goes directly toward providers, is that um, part of that goes toward salary development and, and education and training so that the, the salary and, and wage levels start to move up so that we as companies can start pushing that agenda as opposed to sitting back and waiting for, for it to happen. I think for me, it's really thinking about where our values are. So if we talk about the importance of children and education and families, are we putting money there? So yeah. making sure that we get them to a living wage. I also sit on the South St. Petersburg CRA with Dr. Davis, and we talk about housing a lot and affordable housing. And people love to have a discussion until it's in their backyard, and they're like, not here. But when you think about workforce housing and other things, like if people can't live here, if they're driving you know, an hour or over to serve your children, at some point, they're not going to do that. And we have to think about what it really means to have these opportunities in St. Petersburg and Pinellas County as a whole, where we have equitable economic development and things where we bring people in and we're serving the whole so we have a workforce that can serve our children. And really, as you said, just respecting them, respecting them and thanking them for the time. And to me, this is my village. I can't be with my children all the time. So I'm trusting you to pour into them as well and know that I'm gonna support you in that work. There's, there's the issue too, and I'll, I'll make um, a prediction. Go out on a limb here for a minute. Uh, back in the 70s, I'm old enough to have started working in the, the early 70s. Uh, and at that point in time, women were entering the workforce in a much different way. It's, so we're in a similar type of situation right now in that a lot of women stayed back after the pandemic or found jobs where they could work from home so that they could be with their children. So I think um, we're going to see an influx of child care centers early learning centers that are uh, developed by uh, large employers or um, work campuses, um, maybe several employers on those campuses, but uh, make those available so that they can attain and re attract a new workforce. So um, I don't think it's gonna happen immediately, but once everybody fig figures out what the workforce looks like post pandemic, I think you start seeing some of that happening again. Listen, we want to thank the panelists again for not only being present with us, but for all the work that you're doing in this space. Thank you so much. Can we again? Please? And we want to give um, Pastor Carlos a round of applause, too. He did such a great job <laughs> moderating. Well, we are at the end of our time together. Um, thank you again to all of our panelists. You all shared some powerful and valuable information. We truly appreciate your time and your expertise. Um, if you do want to um, ask a follow-up question, maybe there's something else you want to know a little bit more about from any of our panelists, please contact them. Their um, email is up there. If you want to take a, a picture of it, go ahead. For Dr. Benson, if you want to talk to her, you can talk to her afterwards and she'll give you her information because we can't put her email up there for a good reason, but she could tell you afterwards. Next slide. All right, so we talked about our impact goal being 90%. We want to see 90% of our children here in 
Pinellas enter kindergarten ready um, by 2028. Currently, our readiness rate is 60 percent. Um, so we have some work to do. But as was, it was echoed by everybody up here, this is not a problem that one organization can solve. Even with having billions of dollars, one um, entity, one person cannot do it, nor should they. It requires a village. It requires a team. It requires a community of folks who said who, who are willing to say that we're, we're going to put our fingers to the plow, our hands to the plow, and we're going to do the work together um, because our kids really are counting on us and we are counting on them. They're going to be the people who are taking care of us and running things in a few years. And the older that I'm getting, the years are going by way, 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 way faster than they used to. And I imagine you all are experiencing that as well. So we're going to blink and these babies are going to be adults. And so we have to put in good stuff as early as possible. And again, it takes all of us. So we invite you to join the movement. If you are not a part of the Thrive by Five network, we want you to be you have some type of skill, resource, or expertise that would be invaluable to our organization. Um, we are, we are Thrive by Five, and we want you to become a part of that. So we have a really fancy QR code up here. <laughs> so you can, you can pull your phone out and it'll, it'll pull up the website. The website gives you more information about who we are and what we do and how you can get connected through one of our work groups or as a volunteer, or as a community investor, um, we want you to join the movement. So thank you again for your time. We truly appreciate you. We hope you got something meaningful out of this experience and uh, have a great afternoon. Thank you.